All right. Well, first I want to thank everyone here for attending our presentation. Hopefully you'll find it as interesting as we have over the last uh, years of, of studying this thing. And uh, just to kind of give you an idea, this is, this, the title of today's presentation is The Dirty Little Secret About Powering Audio Using the Receptacles That You Plug Everything in Your System Into. Now that may sound a little strange that that would be considered an issue, but yeah, there are actually a couple things you have to look out for, so let's talk about what those are. For, you, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm sure most of <laughs> you in this, in this room don't, um, at least at this point, um, I'm Ken Rindell, president and founder of KCC Scientific. Um, spent a lot of my time uh, helping out customers with uh, solving power problems and other things that might have happened in their system in setting it up. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, jump around here to the next slide and uh, kind of get going. And this is what we're going to cover. Um, what we're going to talk about is uh, pretty much what you see up there, frequency, amplitude, waveform variations. Um, something that people don't talk about very much is uh, current waveform distortion, which is what we're going to put on the topics. Power factor correction. How many people here know what power factor correction means? Well, there's a few. That's great. All right. Well, so having spent on the order of about uh, 40 years in the test and measurement industry doing in precision instrumentation, I feel compelled to understand these things. So that's kind of how we got to where we are here. And then we're going to wrap it all up with some recommendations. So let's start with the first, which is frequency stability. And that's probably the one that we hear about and talk about the least. But a little bit of interesting history first that some folks may find kind of wild. Early AC frequencies uh, across the world were anywhere from 16.66 hertz to 133 hertz. Can you even believe that? In 1918, London alone had 10 different operating frequencies on the power line. And uh, it took quite some number of years before the European countries united under a common uh, you know, frequency standard, and playing around down around 40 hertz for a while. Uh, Western Japan actually settled on 60 hertz, while Eastern Japan settled on 50. And yes, it's still that way today. So North America, on the other hand, established 60 hertz in, 19, in the 1920s. So they kind of had the lead on that. And you wonder, why would there have been so many standards? Well, one of the reasons is because, remember, back then, we were still experimenting with the right kinds of magnetic materials for transformers. We were, there was even discussions over whether it should be DC or AC. So there was a lot of flux a lot of learning going on, and what one country thought was going to work best for them, other country wouldn't believe or wouldn't suggest that would be the way to go. And where we ended up is probably more related to lighting flicker than anything else, ultimately. So meanwhile, we have the early 20s going on, mid-20s. And a gentleman here by the name of Henry Warren, who had a major and significant effect on why we control frequency today, and in fact, how it's controlled. And it did evolve, it changed, but he was the leader in kind of getting the whole ball rolling. Well, a little history on Henry. He, uh, he loved working with tools and playing around with electrical things when he was growing up his entire childhood. Ultimately went to, uh, got to uh, MIT, got his uh, MS or BS E in 1894, then moved to Ashland. And uh, by about uh, his 40s, had about 135 patentable inventions. And uh, even developed something that I'm sure every one of you are familiar with, with, which is the shaded pole AC synchronous motor, which is used in many turntables, not all, but many and tape transports and other audio reproduction equipment. And it's historical. It's gone on as long as there's been a regulated power line frequency. Now, the more, more important thing or more interesting thing related to controlling frequency was his inventions related to the master clocks that controlled the generators that created electricity. Believe it or not, electric clocks or master clocks that would operate with basically two gearing systems, one connected to the power line and another one connected to a pendulum clock. And those two were compared and the difference was displayed and that was what was used to manually change 
the frequency. Well, why did anybody really care about frequency back then in the first place? So what if it was 61 hertz? So what if it was 58? Well, at the time you had a nascent electronics field beginning, you had radio, you had television research going on, you had experimental systems. You had to control the frequency or you could cause serious damage to the, uh, to the components in these, in these systems. Remember, magnetics were quite nascent at the time and you couldn't push them much beyond their limits. So here's another example of a, of a, a master clock that was used to control the, the generators that produce the electricity. And remember, as it works, when the generator slows down, the frequency slows down. When it speeds up, so goes the frequency. So unless you can keep that generator operating at a constant speed, you're gonna have a problem with that. So if you look at a modern power plant today, let me jump back. A modern power plant is a way more complex system than a master clock, but it operates fundamentally on the same principle. The only difference is much of it's automated as opposed to reading a clock dial and turning up the steam or the water or turning it down to control the speed of the generator. So in the back of your mind, you might be thinking by now, are you telling me that my turntable speed depends on a generator somewhere on the other end of town? And the answer is, uh, yeah, it does. Now, if you look at this particular uh, diagram, I want you to pay attention, don't get into detail. We're gonna, it's after lunch, so I don't want anybody falling asleep going into detail here. But there's a couple of interesting things that you need to look at. One is that there's a program dead band in the way that that frequency is controlled, which means it's gonna go way down before anything happens to bring it back up again, and the same vice versa holds. And that's on purpose, and why would you do that? Well, again, you can't jerk a 50-ton flywheel around back and forth. You've gotta do this slowly and gently which means you're gonna get some roll, you're gonna get some, some movement of that frequency up and down. It's, it's unavoidable, it's just the way the physics work. And the same with the mechanical clock solution. That's why you could do it with a mechanical clock. It's because the generators move slowly, but m maybe faster than you think because you can observe over a couple of seconds or even a minute some pretty substantial changes, but in any case, Obviously, having automated systems today will do a much better job than a master clock could have. So how stable is the frequency in the U.S.? Let's start with the U.S. because we can look at other countries, too. Well, this data is actually not my data. This is taken from leapsecond.com, which is an interesting site. If you have a chance, go visit it. It's a lot of fun. But one of the things that he did was he monitored the frequency over a period of several days. And you can see for yourself what the peaks and valleys were there that he observed. And it's pretty, uh, there's a lot of noise going on in between there. Now, I didn't have a whole lot of time to take data, but I took a few points in Broomfield, Colorado to see where, it, where our site is, to see what the frequency would do. And over about a 24 hour period or so, I observed about 0.35% peak to peak change. That's noticeable. That's real, that's, that's real speed change there. Now, it's, we don't get any relief from Europe because they have the same problem we do, and in some ways, they've had some more interesting negative experiences with it. So at the bottom, at the top you see it's kind of like the, the big picture over many days, and then the bottom you see you know, a shorter period over maybe a few hours or so, and you'll see that the same kind of data is there that we saw when we looked at the situation in the U.S. So one of the conclusions that I drew looking at this data was this seems to be getting worse. It seems that over, as time goes on, as the, as the power grid gets loaded, and as more things become you know, powered and depending upon electricity to function, this gets worse. How good will it be in the future? Well, let's talk about, let's talk about some terminology here. There's this thing called TEC. TEC is time error correction. That was one of the primary purposes of controlling the line frequency in the first place so that electric clocks could proliferate as basically standard time sources for folks who wanted to know what time it was in their house and it worked very well. But does it mean that the line frequency is exact at any given point in time? It means that over about a 24 hour period it'll be right. But in between, no way. It can vary by as much as what you saw. It could vary tenths of percent over that time, but the number of cycles counted up over 24 hours 
is going to work out about right. So what does the math say? Something like about your turntable will rotate on the order of 48,000 times per day, but it'll be exact. But I can't guarantee what, it, what the speed's going to be like in between. And that's kind of the way this all works out. Meanwhile, uh, there's two organizations. NERC, which is the governing body in the U.S. that, um, you know, regulates the way the power generation companies do their job. And NAES, any NAESB, which is kind of an overarching, uh, kind of from the commercial side. So, so NAESB is from the commercial side, NERC from the technical side, actually proposed initially in the, in the beginning of this, this century, actually in improving the regulation. But after they studied that for a few years, they walked away and said, nah, I think we just got to look at getting rid of time error correction. Of course, you know what that would do to all the electric clocks in the world. They would all be lousy timekeepers. So that's been stalled, that's been pushed back, but it, that has been considered. And we have to be aware that that might actually happen at some point in time. So why would you get rid of it if it's working in terms of keeping time? Well, it turns out that it is working, but on the other hand, it isn't. In order to make it work, it means that you have to keep the generator speeds within a certain range. And when it goes, there's very tight regulations on that. When that starts going out, you pull like crazy to pull it back. And in fact, those overreactions can lead to, you know, overcompensations and overshoots, which may actually make control harder and make it worse. And the only reason given to maintain it is for electric clocks. So, and you know, synchronous electric clocks are uh, not quite as popular these days as they once were. So how does it affect audio? Well, as I said earlier, these motors in our turntables are directly affected by the changes in frequency. Now, if you have a motor speed control on your turntable, okay, you know, you're good, you're fine. You won't be affected by it. But then you'll have to evaluate the performance of that speed control on its own merits. And I can't make any comments on that because it just depends on who's the manufacturer and what they were paying attention to when they designed their product. So, you know, no, no, nothing here I can say about that. But on the other hand, it's turntables, it's tape players, and anything else with a motor in it that helps you reproduce music or modify music in whatever way it might be. And if you have a turntable or a pro tape device that you count on for pitch and accuracy, might be a good idea to look at a way to, to regulate that frequency. Because is it audible? That's the big question. Well, to some people it is. To our partner that was right next door to us in our, in our, uh, in our booth over here, definitely noticed it and was definitely able to improve it with frequency control. Yes, you have a question? Okay, yeah. Yeah, the question, is, the, the question is, some manufacturers have boxes that do that, that actually do that regulation. And the answer to that is yes, they do. And those are the speed controls. And yes, those are great. But again, you have to, you have to evaluate those based upon their performance specs. It's tough to make generalizations. One might be good, one might be bad. It's, it's tough to say. So let's jump over and talk about amplitude issues. And these, I think, are a lot more familiar to the folks here, right? Because we know about brownouts and we know about surges. We hear about local loading effects. They happen. Something happens next door, something happens in a factory or even in your own home. An appliance turns on, the voltage changes, and that could cause problems. Or you can get a lightning strike. You want to talk about a real amplitude stability issue. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a few minutes. How concerning are these issues? Well, in the US, the power supply is, is regulated or controlled or specified between 105 and 125 volts AC. And that's a pretty wide range. Now, I've observed brownouts um, in various locations we've lived that have dropped well below 90 volts. And likewise, surges that have exceeded 135 volts for reasonable periods of time, enough time to actually have an effect on, on things. So it's not just the amplitude itself. It's also the rate of change that you're worried about. The things, the things that really get you in electronics are things that happen more rapidly than the electronics is designed to tolerate. And you know, if you get the voltage big enough, it can saturate the magnetics, your, your, your power transformers and your audio equipment. That's a problem. And uh, the, the, the kind of things that happen as a result of saturation are, 
are blown fuses and damaged circuits. And if you get, you get voltages too high, you might even cause capacitors to do some pretty ugly things, like explode. Well, what about lightning strikes? Well, lightning is, regardless of what anybody tells you, lightning is literally unstoppable. I used to work in the measurement side of the oil and gas industry where we were doing remote monitoring of pipeline health. And we had these devices that were out there mounted by themselves, hooked up to the pipelines. And you got a lightning strike, there was nothing you could do. All you could do is mitigate it if the lightning strike didn't occur too close to where you were. So the good news is these don't happen very often. I mean, I've, I've seen a few in my days, but not a whole lot of them. And usually surge protection and, and will help you to some extent as long as the lightning strike isn't too close. If it is, the only thing that's going to help you is unplug all your stuff when a storm comes rolling through. So, but, you know, and the thing you need to do there is you just need to look at all, every form of protection you can get. Surge protection, isolation, and even mains reconstruction because you need as many barriers as you can put in between you and the power line. And you know, obviously the, the, the things that we look at with respect to its effect on audio, well, over voltage obviously will damage things. Under voltage will make things shut down. The changes themselves could cause damage. And um, you can hear effects due to amplitude and waveform errors and noise as well. And we actually demonstrated some of that in our in our, in our uh, area yesterday and this morning. So how do you fix that? How do you get around these problems? Well, most of you probably know. You talk about surge protectors, power conditioners, regenerators. They're all helpful. They're expensive, but they're helpful. And absolutely, you want to use them. They help, they help a lot. Some folks will say, well, you know, power conditioners take some of the life out of the, out of the music. Um, and, and say, you know, regenerate is the right way to do it because it adds life. I'm not here to, you know, pass judgment or make any recommendations on those things. You got to listen for yourself and decide. But you have to do something because you just can't, you can't let those, those issues affect your audio quality. So, but the problem is that most of the things that are designed today to do this amplitude correction or protection cannot stop serious surges and are limited in terms of how deep a brownout they can handle. They don't regulate frequency. And that's an important point. None of the things that are out there today can regulate frequency. And if you have something that depends on the frequency, you need to regulate frequency. <laughs> so, and of course, they, most of them, I haven't seen any that actually isolate. In other words, put a transformer in between the primary and, the, and, what, you're trying to, and what you're trying to power. And of course, they don't fix power factor issues. Uh-oh, a new term, power factor. We talked about that. Well, we'll get to that in a second here. Let's jump over and talk about waveform purity now. You know, noise, distortion. Does anybody know what this is? I'll give you a couple of guesses. It might have been once. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty close. What this is, it's the voltage measurement in my living room socket. That's right off my living room socket. So why isn't it a clean sine wave? Everybody told us it was a, that what was coming off the power was a clean sine wave, right? There was nothing powered in that room. Why wasn't it a sine wave? Well, it turns out that it's the fault of all the equipment that we buy and we use and we love and we depend on. It Stuff all distorts what's coming in. It, destro it destroys the integrity of it, makes it look flat on the tops, makes, gives you noise, gives you distortion, and it's all there for you to enjoy. And of course, heavy motors and appliances don't make things better either, as I'm sure you know. Well, we would mentioned the, the concept of power factor correction. I'm going to expand on it just a little bit in, in a kind of a simplified way. So power factor is all about the way the voltage and the current relate to each other. When you're, low, when you're drawing current and you're measuring that, that waveform, you have voltage and you have current. That, the product of those two is power. And the way they relate is power factor. And just because you have a sine wave, clean, linear signal coming in doesn't mean you're drawing current. 
in that same linear way. And at the bottom of this, you see the yellow is the waveform coming in. It's the voltage waveform on the power line that you just saw in my living room. The bottom is what happens when you load it with a resistor. Well, a resistor is pretty linear until you get a linear waveform. Don't need the power factor to correct that. That's pretty clean. The problem is that when you start to load with reactive things, things that have some impedance, when you start to run them through power supplies that have rectifiers, the whole thing changes. And unfortunately, most of the audio equipment in this building has those linear power supplies built in. And what's a linear power supply? Well, here's how they're mostly built up. We have AC coming in, we have a power transformer, we have rectifier diodes and a large filter capacitor, and then off it the signal goes to your, your wonderful, beautiful tube circuit that you listen to. That's typically the way they're built. Not a lot of exceptions. Well, what's going on here? What's going on here? Remember I said that power factor is the relationship between the voltage and current? Well, let's look at the current. Who looks at the current? Does anybody look at the current? I look at the current. The top waveform, once again, is that same living room sine wave we talked about earlier. The bottom is the current being drawn by that linear power supply that I just showed up there that is base, the basis of most of the things in this, in this building. So let me ask you a question. If we can get all upset and worried, I mean, you think most of the people in this room would look at that voltage waveform up there and go, oh my gosh, I gotta do something about that. That looks terrible. But what about the current waveform? Why don't we worry about that? Is it because it's harder to measure? It's still there, and guess what? Look at the relationship between the RMS and the peak. The top waveform, the RMS and peak are related by 1.414. That's the definition of how a sine wave is, is you know, set up. The bottom one, the peak, the current is being drawn only on the peaks of the voltage, incoming voltage waveform. So now you've got like a 7x increase in the peak current. That's seven times what the RMS current would be if it was resistive. Seven times. That's huge. That means if your amplifier is drawing an amp, or let's say it's something a little more dramatic. Say it's drawing two or three amps when you're pumping out that deep bass or four amps off the power line. That means you're, getting, you're pulling 28 amp spikes through 100 feet of Romex in your house. Now, how is that good? I don't see how that's a good thing. I mean, you get peaks like that, and you're, gonna get, you're, gonna, you're bound to generate some fields. You're bound to generate some interference. For some reason, nobody seems to care about that. I'm not really sure why. Well, how do you mitigate, how do you mitigate these issues? And again, I, I don't understand why nobody wants to really talk about the current waveform when the voltage waveform and the current waveform are directly related. <laughs> in a nonlinear way, it turns out, in most power supplies. Well, regenerators are a great idea for cleaning up the waveform. Absolutely cool. Great, great idea. Problem is, they're not really designed to improve the current distortion. So that's always going to still be there. It may be that mains reconstruction with a PFC front end is the only way to cure this, this ill. Or we can continue to ignore it, not worry about the audio effects it creates. <laughs> so, well, I'm gonna wrap up here um, with, a, with a quick summary and then I'll be happy to take questions. But it turns out that mains for many things, not everything, but for many things, mains reconstruction may be the only way out. What does mains reconstruction mean? It means we start with the line, turn it into DC, and then we recreate a brand new waveform from that DC, which has nothing to do with the original AC waveform. And then we isolate it, so that now we have no relationship between what's coming out on the line and what's going into the audio equipment. So what would that do for us? Well, it gives us the ability to control the frequency, which is important in a lot of applications. It regulates the voltage, so we don't have these issues with brownouts and surges and all those things, those all go away. Cleans up the voltage waveform because now you can make the waveform anything you want. Why not make it a perfect sine wave? It softens the current spikes flowing through the household wiring because of the PFC front end conditioning. And for most of us, I think one of the more important things is it adds uh, several layers of protection 
from these brownout surges, transients, and other things. And I'm not claiming that anything is going to protect you from a direct lightning strike, but it sure does help. Okay, so that's kind of the conclusion of the main part of the program, and I'd be happy to take some questions now. Okay, we got well, the way this works is we're going to have a mic, a fellow coming over with a mic, and then I'll repeat the questions. What's the PFC you're talking about? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, PFC is power factor correction. What it is is it's a circuit that actually straightens out that problem with the peak current is, that we showed. It actually makes it, it actually makes it basically linear. It makes it look resistive. They generally do a pretty good job. Whereas without it, you end up with that current being drawn only on the peak of the sine wave, which is what gives us that current distortion. So that's basically what it does. There's more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, here. I don't have any turntables or, 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 or reel to reels or motor driven equipment. I'm, I'm all digital. And all my equipment has linear power supplies mm -hmm. uh, with good voltage regulation. So if you have adequate voltage regulation on linear power supply, doesn't that solve everything? It solves a lot. It solves a lot. So the question is, to, to kind of repeat it, he doesn't have any turntables, but he has really good, he has equipment that has really good linear power supplies with linear regulation on the output. And the question is, doesn't that clean things up pretty well? And the answer is, yeah, it does. It helps a lot. It does. But it doesn't do anything for the current waveform spikes. You're still going to have those. And if you have a sensitive preamp and you have a noisy power line coming in, you still have all those issues. And you're still going to have the issues that, you know, we talked about with respect to brownouts and noise and transients, over voltage and so forth. So those are still things to think about. The, the one fellow I talked to yesterday, it was an interesting, interesting discussion, told me that he actually made a huge difference in the sonic quality of his system by running, I don't remember what he said, it was like eight or 10 gauge wire right to his outlets, a short line right from his box. And then he actually had the electric company come in and they changed the amperage rating of his box so that he eliminated some of the voltage drops due to the current flowing through all that copper along the way. And honestly, that's a really great, that's a really great way to, to help things out. But it doesn't do anything for the noise on the power. It's still there. So you still have to think about that. Yes? Oh, we have two. What should we do here? Um, Flip a coin. The question is, some Sorry, of the back. audio amplifiers, they have some humming noise. Mm -hmm. And apparently it's due to some DC in the AC line. Is there a way to block that? Okay, I'm gonna to try to repeat the question. I'm sure I got it all, but um, so some audio amplifiers have, uh, you experience noise because supposedly there's some distortion on the AC line. Oh, DC. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Why does DC matter? Well, DC matters because DC and transformers don't get along real well. Even a small amount of DC current flowing through a power transformer will cause it to move off the center of its BH curve more towards saturation. And now, you know, it's like having an overvoltage because you get pushed up beyond the saturation limit of the transformer and it clips one end of the waveform. Oh my gosh, I mean, that's going to create problems. That's going to cause problems with the output voltage of the power supply. It's going to cause problems with noise. It's going to cause a myriad of issues. If it doesn't blow your fuse, you're lucky. So um, one way to get around that problem is to put a transformer in between the power line and the, and the, um, and the load, which is not as sensitive to DC. That's kind of hard because they're going to have the same problem your transformer is going to have. But the reconstruction thing solves that because it gets anything DC out of there. It turns, literally turns it into DC to start with, and then it turns that DC and AC in a way that's controlled so that the transformer won't saturate. It's very, it has to be symmetrical to make that work. So that, yeah, that, that's another way to solve it. Yes, we had up front here. Hi. Uh you described the negative impact of uh, power fluctuations on things like a mechanical device, like a turntable. In uh, today's digital world, there's a lot of uh, 
uh, opinions about uh, the impact that clocks have um, and the improvement that can be provided uh, eliminating jitter, but clocks in particular. Can you talk a little bit about any potential effects that uh, power fluctuations have in the digital world, particularly with clocks? Okay, uh, the question is, there's a lot of discussion about things like turntables and so forth, but what about the digital world and digital equipment and how does power fluctuation af affect jitter and so forth in the clocking system? I, I assume, for example, DAX and uh, similar things and perhaps certain power supplies that require very good jitter or class D power amps and things like that, I assume is what you mean. Um, well, you know, I kind of would guess that the power supplies are probably pretty well, other than the issues we've already brought up, the power supply is pretty well isolated from the clock generation circuitry if the equipment's designed right, so that's probably not gonna have a big effect on it. But you still have all the other issues to deal with because noise is noise, and if it gets into your, if it gets into any of the analog circuitry, because guess what? No matter how digital it is, there's analog circuitry somewhere in there. And you gotta take that digital signal, turn it into analog or you can't listen to it. And somewhere you're gonna have an issue with coupling of noise and all the other issues with power supply reliability that come up as a result of brownouts and, and all the other issues that you run across with power lines. Question here? Is that uh, we, helpful? Good. We actually have a question from our YouTube stream. Um, don't the power supply of most electronics Amps, amp receivers, DACs, already have regulation inside, why worry? Most people won't be able to hear a noisy power mains using a digital sound, it's ones and zeros. You know, it's really, okay, so everybody heard that question, right? It's really tough to make general comments about complex electronic systems, but you know, the regulation in the circuitry that you're working with isn't necessarily where the, the source of where the noise will couple in. You have a transformer in the front end of pretty much every one of the power supplies. Eh, some of them don't, some of them have switching circuits and so forth, but you have a power supply and that power supply has to be energized by the mains. Well, that <laughs> every transformer has some leakage inductance, has some leakage magnetics, and that magnetics, the leakage, can be 60 hertz or it can be any frequency at all that might be contained on that waveform coming in. So the, good, the question is, it could be a problem or maybe it isn't a problem, but it's very difficult to say for sure that it isn't. Now, I can tell you this, one piece of equipment might be fine. Another piece of equipment maybe isn't so good. It so much depends on the design that you can't make generalizations. I'm familiar with uh, power regenerators and power conditioners. What is this mains reconstruction exactly? So mains reconstruction, okay. So the question is, what really is mains reconstruction? Well, mains reconstruction means that you're not taking the existing power and processing on it and then sending it back out with some modification. You're starting over. You're literally saying, okay, the AC on this waveform, I'm gonna use that to create DC, and that's the end of it. It's gone. And now, I take that DC and I turn it into AC. And that AC is controlled for frequency and amplitude and sent out the terminals and used to power things. That's the difference. It's not filtered. So maybe I should explain something. A fil the other way around. A filter takes the power line and rejects certain frequency components and passes a clean version of the sine wave out. Well, I have never seen a filter that would clean up some of the sine waves I've seen around here. No filter is going to do that, but what it will do is take off some of the higher end noise components that, that fall in the audio band, and that helps, no question, that will help. And then there's some folks that say, well, if you put a filter in series with the power, it actually deadens the sound. I can't make a judgment on that, but you know, some folks would hear it and some folks would hear it differently. But that's the general idea. And there, where that comes from is there's series resist resistance in those filters. And that series resistance that is added to the line can soften the power supplies that are in the amplifiers and so forth and cause them to sag. For example, if you got a heavy bass note and you're listening, you get a drop in the voltage and you can clip or 
you get other audible effects because of the non-infinite rejection of the front end. Every front end on every amplifier rejects the power supply fluctuations to some degree, but not perfectly. But again, it depends on the design of the system how well they do. So, but anyway, when you regenerate, you have eliminated you know, any need to filter and you've, you've obviously cleaned up the frequency if you need it cleaned up. It's, it's a really great way to go. Not for everything, but for quite a few things. Uh, we have another one from the stream. Does a well-designed switching power supply present a better load towards the power line? Okay, very good question. A well-designed switching power supply, actually there are, there are regulations about this, and you've probably heard of Energy Star and some of these other things, that specify that above a certain power level, you have to use power factor correction. Because without it, you will generate harmonics and you will generate other aberrations in the power line that are very undesirable to somebody else who's using that power line somewhere nearby. So the answer is, if you have a well-designed switching power supply on the line that's PFC corrected, you absolutely will improve its effects on the power line, without a question. I, I would imagine, although I'll tell you, I haven't seen a whole lot of linear power supplies that don't have current distortion. It's really hard to do. <laughs> I mean, I've seen people attempt it and they get better, but it causes other problems. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a tough one. The answer to your question is maybe. It might be better, but it just depends on the design. Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, if you have mains reconstruction, uh, is one single one is sufficient? How about component interaction? Say you're powering your whole system. There are digital components and analog components involved. Uh, do they not affect the other components in the system? That's a good and, question. Unless that's, you have some kind of yeah. isolation or filtering that's, that's or both. That's a good question. That's a very, very, very good question. And the question is, if you have reconstructed waveform, aren't you back in the same boat again where <laughs> you could have interactions? Well, one thing is you've gotten away from the power line and that helps a whole lot. So that's a big plus. Two is the frequency isn't gonna be affected at all, not at all, by one piece of equipment being loaded by the other. It, is, it absolutely won't, won't be affected. And then you only have, okay, what about the peak current being pulled? Well, it depends on what's, what the regenerator, or what the, the reconstruction circuit looks like. If it has good solid output impedance and it can drive multiple loads. I mean, especially if you're talking about a few hundred watts, three, four, five hundred watts, it's not that hard to do, it's to get it to, to, get it to work well. If you've talked about kilowatts, and mm, that's another story, <laughs> which is the, the battle you're fighting because you've got kilowatts going on all around you and you're trying to pull a few hundred watts clean. That's a problem. Or harder. For a mains reconstruction, are you talking going from AC to DC to AC or going from AC to a battery bank or back to AC or how are you talking about that? Well, okay, so the question is, are you talking about going from AC to DC to AC or from AC to DC to a battery bank and then to AC? You know what, you could do it either way. You know, the, 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 the battery just helps, A, it gives you backup in case the power fails. And then the next thing is it gives you a little bit of a stiffer supply for driving the rest of the circuitry. But you could usually design the reconstruction circuit so it doesn't care as much about that. So you don't need to have the battery, is what I'm saying. That battery gives you isolation. We need a mic here. Uh, this is that that battery gives you isolation that you didn't have. Well, the question is, when you is, are connected to the AC, does a battery give you isolation? Um, I guess it could if you charged the battery and disconnected it. <laughs> <laughs> then you're isolated. I have hum problems if I don't. I'm sorry? I have hum problems if I don't because I have some ground loop issues. But as soon as I disconnect the AC, the hum's gone. Okay, okay. So the point he's making is that if he doesn't do that, he has hum issues. Have you thought about using an isolation transformer? That would probably eliminate the, ground hum, the hum you're seeing. It, it tends to. 
because it breaks up. There's, there's, reason, there's reasons why. We could draw it up. There's reasons why you get these things in a typical home system. I mean, literally, it, it's hard to believe. But if you plug in an outlet over here in your home and you go, oh, I'm out of outlets. I'm going to plug over here to the rest of the system. Those two outlets could have completely different paths back to ground. Completely. I mean, 50 feet difference. You, you're going to aggravate problems with ground loops when you, when you have that situation. And there's no way you would know. So, yeah, I mean, isolation would help. Yes? Yeah, two are phono sections, uh, old, you know, one's a Camelot and one's a, an old Michael Yee thing. And then um, I also have an amplifier um, that was designed many years ago that has this huge battery. Yeah, it has a very large battery that charges up over nine hours and then plays for three, four hours. And then, you know, but, but that does, it does sound different dramatically yeah. in all cases. Okay, and I'm assuming that's the effect you're talking about, right? That's, yeah, okay. That's so, effectively trying to do some version of that, of right. that right? Yeah. To repeat, to repeat the, the point, yeah. this gentleman is saying that he actually has a system that has batteries that power different things in his system, but through this kind of an arangement where it turns it into DC and then, and then back into AC, and then the battery is the DC source, and he can completely decouple from everything because he's now in batteries. And the answer is, yeah, that, that works. That would work. But I bet you there's other ways to do it, but that method would work. Absolutely. Is there a publication out there that can tell us how to design and implement an effective mains reconstruction in our, in our homes? OK, the question is, uh, is there a publication out there that can help with how to do this whole mains con reconstruction thing? And the answer is, not that I know of, but it's a really darn good idea, and we're going to write that one down. <laughs> but by the way, stop over at our, our booth, and we'll talk more about that. Well, we're right next door here in the back. Yes, sir. I heard that uh, if you change the gauge wiring on your listening room from, let's say, 18 to 10, that improved the sound. Is there anything you could say about that? Well, you, when you say, okay, so the question is, he's heard that if you change the wiring in your room from 18 gauge to 10, will that help? Well, maybe, and here's what I mean. If, you're, if you have 18 gauge wire, and I think a lot of stuff does because it's the, it goes by rating and they build the cheapest wire they, they can to accommodate the ratings. You pull current through that wire, you're going to get voltage drop. Voltage drop at that, you know, changes, remember we said, changes in voltage are troublesome because they cause things to work differently depending on how much current they're drawing. So yes, it does help, but only to the point of the outlet. So from the outlet to your equipment, having better cables absolutely helps. No question about it. I'm not going to tell you how much, I'm not going to tell you how good it sounds. It just will help technically because you get less voltage drop. But then you got to go look at the rest of the 50 feet from that outlet back to the, <laughs> the box. Like the gentleman I talked to yesterday, he's like, he had to change the wiring in his house to get it to work right, to get it to sound good. So yeah, as, as far as it goes, they do help is, is the answer to the question. So, and, and, I, and I totally am not trying to advocate any supplier or anybody on this. It's just technically a better idea to have thicker gauge wire. Especially if you're pulling hundreds of watts. If you're pulling oh, 10 watts, yeah, I don't know. I mean, technically, that's gonna, somebody's going to have to do a listening test and convince themselves that it helps if they're only pulling a few watts. But if they're pulling hundreds of watts, absolutely going to matter. No question. We got one more here. Oh, we got one here. Okay, good. So when you're dealing with conversion losses on this, uh, how much do you have to uh, compensate for that as far as going from AC to DC and back to AC again? Are you just hooking a power supply right to an inverter, or what method are you using okay. for that? Well, yeah. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. The question is, when you're doing this AC to DC to AC thing, 
there's conversion losses, right? What do you do about that? And are there particular means and so forth? Well, the answer is anytime you, can, you, you mess around with power and you change it from one form to the next, you have to look at efficiency. And if you can keep the efficiency in a reasonable mid-power system above 90%, you're doing fantastic. <laughs> it's tough to do. And, but modern, modern components, components are getting better and better as time has gone on. And one of the reasons why, believe it or not, is because of EV, electric vehicles. The power supplies that they need to charge those batteries are astounding. And the devices that have to be developed and invented to support that effort make all of our lives better. So that helps because now you have access to parts that can give you better performance. And now you have access to methods that you can use that you couldn't have used before because you didn't have those devices. So it, it all gets better. And if you can get over 90% with these things, I think, I mean, it's up to you, but since we don't generally pull 500 watts off our system consistently and continuously, maybe some do because we have I'm sure some folks here who like class, class A, and that's great, but normally most people don't pull 500 or 1,000 watts continuous unless they're trying to wire a sound stage. And in that case, we're in a realm of where some of these new devices can really help us and help us do a really efficient job of that conversion. So I'm having a little trouble understanding how a constant voltage source, which would be this main reconstruction device, can change the way a load uh, draws current. So for instance, if you take one of these regenerators and you hook up a, a lamp dimmer to it, well, a lamp dimmer's got triacs or thyristors or whatever, and the current is going to go all over the place, even if you lock the, the voltage. So. Okay. So the question is, how does, a, how does this, I assume you mean the re regeneration or the reconstruction we're talking about, how does that help soften the current? Well, it doesn't eliminate it completely. There's just no way. But it can soften it. And it softens it because there's stages of filtering along the way that give you storage. So you're, you're not pulling it off of just that peak. Now you're pulling it over a wider range, spreading it across the waveform a little better. But it does, you're right. It, just does nothing completely eliminates it once you've now there is a way to do it and the way to do it is you build the power supply with power factor correction built in and you eliminate that from being created in the first place problem solved then but it's going to take a while before <laughs> that becomes a, a universally accepted method of doing power generation inside of equipment so uh, Well, that's a really good question. Tell us about what we've done at our house with our, t with our sound system. Well, truth be told, we have a pretty modest sound system. And so we, we worry about turntable speed. That's the primary issue. And so the frequency, the reconstruction helps with that. And that's primarily the way we've approached our sound systems because they tend to be pretty modest. So, you know, not pulling hundreds of watts and things like that. So. That's generally, so if you look at our, our products, you'll see that it kind of reflects that. They're generally lower power products. So, and if you, you know, if you want a re regenerator, PS Audio's got some really, really awesome devices that will really clean up the waveform, the power waveform, but they won't do much for frequency. So the frequency aspect can be handled at lower power levels because most of the time, like power amplifiers don't care that much about frequency. So that works out. It works out for everybody because it, it generally it applies to kind of this whole world. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the shielding that's in a lot of the power cords you see in the show here, you know, without mentioning a brand. And then the other question, so if you could talk about the different approaches people have and, um, and pluses or minuses. And then the second part of the question is, if you could reconstruct the mains, do you still need the shielding on these power cords or not? Well, oh, that's a really good set of questions. I'll try to repeat those. First of all, the question about, can I comment about what some of the folks are doing with power cords and wiring for the mains power, right? Is that accurate? And then second, if you do this, do you still have to worry about shielding? Well, <laughs> okay, the, the, I'm gonna take the shielding part of that first because that one is, 
That's, amaz that's amazingly complicated, and it's going to depend upon the environment. Why would you need shielding? Let's see. If I run a cord from a power amplifier that's there to a plug that's there, and I shield it, and then I have Romex running 50 to 100 feet in my house that's not shielded, what have I really accomplished? Maybe the near field's better. But if I live in an environment where I have a high level of EMI, you know, believe it or not, we know folks that used to live next to a, a TV station. That got into everything back in the day. And the only way to get that noise out was to use shielded, shielded cables. But that moves the noise further away. It doesn't eliminate it because you still have all the noise in the Romex and everything else running around. So it only helps. Beyond that, <laughs> listening tests the best way to, to evaluate it. And as far as the specific manufacturer question, one versus another, you know, I don't know. That's, that, again, that is something that is individual. It's something where you have to listen to what you're thinking about buying and trying it first and see if it makes a difference for you. Because again, there's so many environmental issues at, at, in play here. You know, you may think, <laughs> you may have a room, you plug your, you have this nice shielded cable and you plug it in here, and in the walls, the Romex is running right by the rest of your system. What have you really done? I don't know. You know, it's, it just so depends on the environment. Okay. Um, oh, we have, we actually have one from the We have one, a YouTube question here. Uh, what's the difference between a power conditioner and mains reconstruction? Wow. Great question. What's the difference between power conditioning and mains reconstruction? Fundamentally, power conditioning is filtering. Fundamentally. That's what it does. It filters harmonics and noise to the best of its ability. Anything that's outside of a certain band, it filters that off the power coming in. Mains reconstruction starts over. It's like, okay, get rid of the power line and all its noise and whatever frequency drift it is. We're going to use it to create DC and then use that to create AC, brand new AC that we completely control and manage. And therefore we can, we can improve the quality of it. That's kind of it. What would be the effect of swapping the neutral to the high on, on the power line for your audio equipment? Okay, what would be the effect of swapping line and neutral on audio equipment? That's a really good one. Now, it depends on what country you're in. It turns out in the U.S. it's one thing, and in other countries in the world it's another because line and neutral in most, in most European countries where they use 230 volts, they're kind of the same. They have, there's really no neutral. They're both live. In the U.S., neutral is meant to be kept close to earth ground, and line is hot, right? So, you know, you're taking a risk with safety if the manufacturer assumed that you're using a three-wire plug. Right. Right. Yeah. I guess I kind of wouldn't suggest flipping them because there may or may not be things in the design of the products that you're buying that will tolerate that. So, yeah, I don't know that I'd do that. It just doesn't seem like a good idea is, is it's so dependent upon what the manufacturer might have done. Now, if they have a transformer connected across those two lines and you flip it, it may not matter. But if internally they connect it another way, like I'm not sure I would do that with a regenerator, that might be a bad idea. So, but I'd have to see the schematic of the regenerator to say for sure. Theoretically, if you could get your audio equipment running DC, would having a single AC to DC transformer for your whole system help substantially? It depends. Okay, the question is, if you could make your whole system run off of DC with that, and you had a single system, a transformer that converted AC to DC, and then you distributed that, now, now we're kind of getting between, you know, Westinghouse, Tesla, and who else was it at the time, Edison? <laughs> What's better, AC or DC? Well, you know what, your entire, most of the electronics in your system, I won't say all, but most of it's DC, let's face it. And if you could get into those power supplies and provide your own DC that was well filtered, conditioned properly, power factor corrected, everything else, it'd be, you wouldn't have to worry about any of this. You know, all this 
AC stuff, would, the problems would go away, except, of course, things like turntables that require AC. You can't get away from that no matter what you do or, or anything with a motor in it that's synchronous. And there are a lot of turntables out there with DC motors and specialized circuitry that will provide super good servo speed control. That's different. And yeah, I mean, the problem is that a lot of those turntables are $13,000 or $10,000. Not everybody wants to spend that on a turntable. But there may be some that I don't know of that are, that are much lower cost and have, you know, the speed control. I'm sure there are, and that's great. But again, you have to evaluate those on their own merits. Look at their specs and make a call on that, as opposed to, there's no generalizations here on that stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I, suggestion, we do have um, a setup in the back right next door, and if someone would like to see some of the benefits of this recent reconstruction we're talking about, feel free to, I know some of you already have. I recognize quite a few faces here today. But if you haven't, feel free to wander on by and we'll set you up. Okay, very good, thank you guys. Great audience, fantastic. <laughs>